the world leader in MMA. Experience it on FS1. Well, the UFC has shipped up to Boston, Massachusetts for the fourth time. A city drunk with sports tradition and success. Now set to play host to the most anticipated Bantamweight Championship in UFC history. And there is the hunted TJ Dillashaw. He is on a meteoric rise on the strength of back-to-back statement-making title defenses. But to make it three, he'll have to handle his toughest challenger to date. Of course, we're talking about that man, the former champion, Dominic Cruz. It has been more than a year since his last comeback from injury. We'll see what the Dominator has planned for an encore tomorrow night as he attempts to regain the bantamweight title he never lost. In the co-main event, number one ranked lightweight Anthony Pettis also on a mission to get the UFC belt back around his waist. And that journey begins tomorrow against Philadelphia's best hope for UFC glory, fellow contender Eddie Alvarez. The FS1 UFC Fight Night weigh-in show starts now. And with that, welcome to the hub of the universe where we will be all weekend long for this historic championship fight. John Anik here alongside the former WEC champion Brian Stan and our UFC insider Ariel Helwani is here. Megan O'Leary backstage, you will hear from her throughout the broadcast as well. All right, so the first men's title fight to hit FS1 and we're glad to have it tomorrow night. TJ Dillashaw defending his Bantamweight championship against the returning former champ Dominic Cruz. We start in the red corner with the champion Dillashaw. How has he gone about taking over this division in Cruz's end? Well, absence? first and foremost, he's an exceptional athlete and competitor. Was a very good collegiate wrestler. Came to the UFC, predominantly a grappler, and with only a, in a few years in the UFC, became one of our most elite strikers. Stance switches, footwork, beautiful combinations, head kick knockouts. I mean, this guy is a vicious offensive machine when he gets inside the octagon. And I've never seen a guy climb that fast in his striking coming from a wrestling background. And guys, as you know, Dominic Cruz's injury is very well documented up until this point, but I actually think that we have done him a disservice. This man is fighting for the UFC bantamweight title in a little over 24 hours. He's coming off of three ACL injuries yeah. and a torn groin. This is unfathomable in my opinion. This is a mixed martial artist coming the highest form on the biggest stage possible. To me, it's superhuman. It's the greatest comeback story in the history of this sport, and I'm honored to be here watching it. The mind is a powerful thing. Dominic Cruz just over 24 hours away from getting back in there with a belt on the line. So also on tap tomorrow night, lightweight division we know always crowded with contenders. Co-main event featuring two of the best number one ranked Anthony Pettis versus fourth ranked Eddie Alvarez. Yeah, you talk about styles make fights. The these guys have exceptional styles to match up with one another. Alvarez is a blistering boxer wrestler that loves to make a fight ugly and bloody. Anthony Pettis has just gorgeous technique, showcased in his last fight just how tough he is. And now he's very hungry to get his belt back. And just like the Gilbert Melendez fight, I feel like we've been talking about this one for a long time, Freddie Alvarez. All right, well, before the action tomorrow night, the inconvenient truth, the fighters are ready to go. We go down to the stage. Here's Mike Goldberg. What's going on, Boston? Great to be here, get things started. Beautiful Luciana, Chrissy, Vanessa. Set for the official weigh-ins for FS1 UFC Fight Night. Cannot wait for this card. One of the best, as I mentioned, in UFC history. All right, let's get it started. In the light heavyweight division. Prasamar Bahozo against Elvis, the King Mutachik. Very happy to see the King finally make his UFC debut. You see he is 15 and three. He has been around the block. Former MFC middleweight champion. How about this? His nickname is the King for obvious reasons. Elvis Presley, right? He was signed to the UFC on January 8th. Elvis Presley's birthday. How strange is that? You Just know, a couple of weeks ago, less Joe, than two Joe weeks ago. Joe Silva does have a sense of humor. Don't be surprised if he set that up. That is a beautiful thing. The stars aligning here for the veteran.
Bajosa comes in telling the media this week that he's really ready for top level competition at 205 pounds, and why not? Now is a great time to make a run in the light heavyweight division, but for Bajosa, he's got to stay healthy. He's only fought one time a year in 2013, 2014, and 2015. He has got to get in a rhythm and consistent, and it needs to start tomorrow night. First time that he gets an opportunity to also fight in the United States. He's very excited about that. And if you're unfamiliar with Mutapcic, has wins over the likes of Zach Cummings, Cesar Fajera, and Sam Alvey. So a very credible fighter and one who, like I said, has been fighting for a long time and hoping and dreaming for this moment. Our first fight tomorrow night exclusively on UFCFightPass.com. Up next in the bantamweight division, This Marine has taken a Fighting long a road to get to the UFC. Long, long time member of Team Quest. That's where he really built and started his career. Then faced multiple deployments while in the Marine Corps. Also duty station changes. Moving from the West Coast, having to go to the East Coast. Finally was able to link up with a team, Team Link in Massachusetts, and now gets his first shot in the UFC. was notified he'd be getting a new opponent for this bout, he didn't expect it to hit quite so close to home. Font's challenger Joey Gomez actually spent some time at Font's home gym, Se Yotong, in 2012 and 2013. The two have shared some practice time together, but should have no problem throwing down tomorrow night. Guys, as you can hear, Font very much a fan favorite here in Boston. Two sort of local guys fighting, and we haven't seen Font since UFC 175. Took a bit of a break, so it's good to see him back. He had a great debut. That's a great match of fight on UFC Fight Pass. Rob Font, Joey Gomez. Next up, in the featherweight position, Charles Boston Strong Rosa faces Kyle Gillaby Botsnia. Born in Gloucester, fighting out of Boston, Kyle Gillibee Bochnia. I'll tell you what, on just day's notice, Kyle Bochnia gets the call, but he's a local kid, trains under Peter Welsh, who has trained several guys who have competed here in the UFC. Also at Paulson Gracie in Boston, under head coach John Clark. This is an extremely aggressive kid with good power in his hands. Should be a very fun addition to the UFC. Guys, he fought for Kyle eight days ago. This man and fought eight days ago. Born in Peabody, Massachusetts, representing American top team, Charles Boston Strong Rosa. They say the third time's a charm, right? Well, that's certainly what Charles Rosa is hoping to be true. The Boston native has had trouble with opponents suffering injuries and pulling out of this bout. Kyle Bochniak is also the, is actually the third man who has agreed to take on Rosa. These two are looking to throw down, and Rosa's looking to repeat a little bit of history. His last UFC win took place right here in Boston last January. Gotta be fun for these Bostonians making that walk in the garden, huh? I like it, a couple of CES veterans. But again, Kyle fought eight days ago, guys, yeah. and here he is making his UFC debut. Takes a lot of guts. Nice win for him, short night, but still.
145 and a half. 145 and a half for Boston Strong. Not that surprising when you watch interviews and you watch some of Kyle's fights. Honestly, he's that kind of hard-nosed, blue-collar kid. You can see it right there. Yeah. This kid loves to fight. To Boston Backyard Brawl, Charles Rosa, Kyle Butchniak. Next up in the light heavyweight division, Alir, the sledgehammer Latifi, fight Sean, the real OC O'Connell. UFC light heavyweight Sean O'Connell isn't First just a fighter. Skater, he spent Sean time working in Africa on mission trips. He's an author and a sports radio host. All of those gigs, he believes, are good distractions to help keep his mind right. And we know Sean is the king of the fun way in face-off, so let's see what he's got up his sleeve for us today once he gets off the scale and faces off with Alir Latifi. And you know, Sean O'Connell would very much like to parlay the radio stuff into a television career here on FS1, but he knows he has to become a more relevant 2 Fiber get higher profile fights in order to make that dream a reality. Two oh five and a half. Two oh five and a half for the real OC. His opponent, one of Sweden's finest, Alir, the sledgehammer Latifi. So guys, true story following the fight card in Orlando just a couple of weeks ago. I took a little small vacation, nothing crazy, don't get too jealous. I'm there at the pool drinking a, a pina colada, and who do I see at the pool in Florida, in Miami? Alir Latifi, just hanging that? out. I, I decided not to take off my shirt. I felt very self-conscious afterwards. He actually came to Florida to train with ATT, still a member of All-Stars, but wanted to get acclimated to the States, and look at him, look at that shape that he's in, the Florida Best sun. we've seen on the scale yes. for him. Did him some very good. Remember, this is the guy who replaced Alexander Gustafsson, his teammate, on just days' notice against Gegger Musasi. He did not look like that when he made his UFC debut. No, he looks fantastic. And in my experience, when you shed some of that bulk and lean out, wow. you generally do get faster. He looks fantastic. Was it a virgin? It, it was absolutely. Look at this. Sean O'Connell with the bouquet. What a nice guy, that Sean O'Connell. And uh, Alir Latifi. Today I'm giving and sharing. What, 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 what are they passing around there? Is that a, 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 a new chocolate on the press or something? Swedish tanny of some sort? I mean, I feel the love here. Are we in the city of You were going to fight a guy looking like Latifi, you'd give him flowers too. Between Paul, the Irish Dragon Felder, and Darren, Detroit Superstar Crookshank. Well, hard to believe, guys, but tomorrow night marks the 13th UFC appearance for Ultimate First Fighter scale, Live veteran Darren, Darren Crookshank. Still training at home, repping that great state of Michigan. Crookshank actually founded Michigan Top Team in Dearborn back in 2013. As usual, his father, Dean, a lifelong martial artist, firmly in his corner tomorrow night here in Beaton. Interesting note, his mother was also a fighter as well. He has memories as a kid watching his mom fight. One fifty-five for Darren Crookshank, and his opponent fighting out of Philadelphia, Paul, the Irish Dragon Felder. Nice ovation for Paul Felder, and that has to feel good. He enters this fight with a bit of a heavy heart. Found out less than two weeks ago that his father has pancreatic cancer. He starts chemo this coming week, and he said that, look, if my dad can fight and beat cancer, then fighting a guy like Darren Crookshank is, you know, that's no fight compared to what my dad has in store for him. Interestingly enough, he says that his parents are his, are his biggest fans, but they never watch his fight. They, they will turn it on, they'll leave it in the room, but they'll walk out of the room and then come back when the fight is over. He will be thinking about his father tomorrow when he fights Crookshank, no doubt. One fifty-five and a half. One fifty-five and a half for the Irish Dragon. Nice ovation, also for Felder, who trains out of Philadelphia, a good friend and training partner of Donald Cerrone, who will be here, but he won't be cornering him. Cerrone says he's the worst corner man in the business. He'll just 
just yell, punch him in the face. That's all he's got. <laughs> Our featured matchup on UFC Fight Pass, Paul Felder and Darren Crookshank. Up next, our first fight, live on FS1, Maximo, Maxi Blanco, faces Luke, Cool Hand Sanders. There he is, Cool Hand Luke, sporting the shades. Also some pretty cool hair as well. Another guy who's taking a fight on very short notice took this fight on less than two weeks notice. This card filled with guys who yeah. are stepping up on short notice, so you have to respect that. He is fighting at featherweight, but he's actually the now former RFA bantamweight champion. As you can see right there, undefeated 10-0, trains at the MMA lab in Glendale, Arizona with the great coach John Crouch, who is right there next to him. And John, I know you would appreciate this. He's a former state championship hockey player at Centennial High in Nashville, Tennessee. So a man of many talents. They don't come much tougher than those hockey players. His opponent, Maximo Blanco! Blanco, the Venezuelan born, now Japanese citizen who moved to Japan in high school. He got recruited to wrestle there. Actually got a bronze medal in the Pan American Games for wrestling in 2007. Has quietly gone on a three fight win streak. And this is a fight where he wins and he could be seeing some true contenders, top 10 guys in the featherweight division. Doesn't seem too confident up there. Well, guys, it's interesting. In his last fight, he missed weight by two and a half pounds. 146. So he makes it. He makes it at the limit, but it looked like he was a little nervous there. Yeah, but that's massive for him. Three fight win streak. He's looked very good his last two fights in particular. If you want to get a contender type yep. fight, you've got to make weight. Coming Our off a 16 second win. Tomorrow on the best one. Up next in the lightweight division, Trace Wade fights Benny, the salt in Baghdad. A proud representative of Arabic fighters from around the world, here is the UFC newcomer, the French-born Medi Baghdad. Now fighting out of Los Angeles, California, the former Muay Thai world champion. One and one, as many of you might remember, as a member of Team McGregor on the most recent season of The Ultimate Fighter. And the man can cook, by the way. Baghdad has a diploma in culinary arts, used to work as a head chef. Comes in tomorrow night with eight career wins by knockout or TKO. So it looks like he's over by one pound. Took this fight on short notice as well. You know, it's interesting, guys. His opponent, Chris Wade. This fight originally was supposed to be Benil Dariush versus Merbek Taisumov. Chris Wade, who you see right there, replaced Dariush. Hold up sex right Yeah, there, it looks like they're going to put Baghdad back on the scale here, at least try to get the towel out. That's fair. Good call there by the UFC executives. I mean, many times we've seen underwear weigh about a pound, so. Well, now he's just re-weighing, so. I feel like it's time to break out the digital scale. Why can't we just use that? Don't you feel like that's more accurate or no? Depends who you ask. Some say uh, it's not as reliable. I would agree with you, though. All right, we're gonna give it a shot with the towel. Betty Baghdad right now, 157. So they're sticking to that, but where's the towel? They didn't bring one up there. Oh, no. There it is. There it is. There it is. Ah, there we go. Okay. And it's branded as well. John, you mentioned he was a part of Team McGregor. He actually called upon one of McGregor's training partners, Tom Egan, who lives here in Boston, to corner him tomorrow. So some McGregor influence will be in yeah. Baghdad's corner tomorrow as well. What's he get 
You know, when you can cook that well, it makes it even that much harder to make weight. Much easier for guys like me when all the food I cook is terrible, so. Well, this is a short notice flight form, too. No, it's, 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 it's not. It's, it's in the middle of the half and the six. Hold on. It's amazing. It's just a scale, but we have a conference going on right that's now. Why, that's what why it means. I maintain the digital he scale. Made he made it! That <laughs> Well done. The fighters backstage waiting to get a drink of water are furious right now. The very patient, Chris Wade. And Chris Wade's ready to go, drops his shorts. New York board, as you mentioned about one of the previous fighters, Brian, quietly looking to go 4 0 in the UFC, Chris Wade. This kid has some serious talent. One fifty-five and a half. One fifty-five and a half for Chris Wade. A member of Long Island MMA, trains with the likes of Dennis Bermudez and Ryan LaFleur. His greatest trait, though, is this man has great taste in sports teams. Die-hard New York Knickerbocker fan, Chris Wade, always tweeting about the Knicks. My favorite Ooh. Twitter feed, the, the New York Knicks. The, Did you say Knickerbockers? The Knickerbockers, yes. It's going to be a hard one. My favorite Twitter feed in MMA, Chris Wade. Awesome, dude. Good luck tomorrow. Chris Wade! Mini Magnet, live on FS1. Next, in the line heavyweight convention, Tim the Barbarian Boach fights Ed Shortbuse Herman. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the man bun. Let's see. There it is, oh, folks. Yeah. Look at that. You know, now, some major changes for Ed Herman. For a long time now, he's lived in Fort Carson, running his own gym. He's left all of it behind, sold his share in the gym, back up the Pacific Northwest in Portland, Oregon, where he started his career for years and feels much better. Yeah, he's one of the many guys now bumping up in weight, yep. feeling he wants to have more energy, and he looks great on the scale of 205. The Barbarian Boach! Yeah, great point, Brian. Tim Boach, he'll be fighting at 205 for the first time since 2010, when six and five as a middleweight, but perhaps unlike Ed Herman, Boach says that this is just a pit stop. He just wanted a fight. Opportunity presented himself, so he's back at 205, but he's probably going to go back down. You see he has former UFC fighter and New England's own Marcus Davis up there with him. He's been training with him again as of late. Boach hungry for a win. He has not won since August of 2014. So this is a big one for him. I think I need to get this Troika of scale. Let's go, you must be at I like to Tomorrow know every moment. Up next in the welterweight division, Patrick the Predator Cote faces Ben Killamy Saunders. And great story here with Ben Saunders. You know, he even says himself in 2010 when he washed out of the UFC, he was a striker with a mediocre ground game. First he really scale, reinvented ben himself, Saunders. become much more well-rounded in his return. Interesting story that I didn't know about him, though. And we're all fathers up here. Told his parents that he was leaving to go to college when he was actually lying and he left yeah. to go start his mixed martial arts career. I spoke with Eddie Bravo yesterday, and he was just lauding everything that Saunders has added to his game on the ground. He said, Cote might take him down. He's not passing his guard. Cote, 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 that's what they're singing for Patrick Cote. In my opinion, this is the most underrated fight of the night. It's flying right under yeah. the radar. We're talking about this one. And, and dare I say, Patrick Cote is the Brian Stan of French Canada. Works for RDS in Quebec. A fantastic analyst. Not quite as good as you, Brian, but he's your equal uh -oh. <laughs> in French town. One 
171. 171 for the Predator. Well, one thing you left out is he could potentially have the greatest chin yes. in UFC history. I mean, this man, he can right, eat right. punches like cupcakes. And, you know, you made a great point, John. Ben Saunders, the guy who people feared his tie clenching, his kickboxing. Now, the guy you don't want to take down, his jiu-jitsu is that good. We start with the first fight on the main card. Ross Pearson fighting Francisco Trinaldo. Trinaldo, an interesting guy. You know, he comes from first extreme game, poverty. Francisco Trinaldo. His nickname, Masaranduba, is actually from a really popular cartoon in Brazil where the character, Masaranduba, is a down-on-his-luck guy who's always <laughs> kicking sand, complaining about things. So that's what this guy's nickname is for. But I'll tell you what, he's not complaining now because his skill set has really grown at Evolution Tie. We saw in his last fight, now finally, the power in his hands materializing, putting together good combinations, and he's got a heck of a streak going for himself right now. Yeah, slight underdog tomorrow night against Ross Pearson. Masa Randuba, direct translation, Brazilian Redwood. Went from being a tough grinder, clinched out fighter, now has good striking. How about that win over Chad Laprise a few months back? That was impressive. Go the other way. 155 and a half. 155 and a half for Trinaldo. His opponent, season nine ultimate fighter, Ross, the real deal, Pearson. Ross Pearson was thrilled when he was offered the opportunity to fight here in Boston. He said he really wanted to fight on the card alongside teammate Dominic Cruz. Ross said when Dominic fights, everyone is in the gym helping him prepare. Dominic makes it a championship atmosphere there. But he did say that during fight week, they stay away from each other. They both admit to being short-tempered during weight cuts, so they keep their interaction limited until they're both refueled and rehydrated. Huh. Dominic Cruz short-tempered? No way. Yeah, he needs Ed Herman's nickname, I think. I'm telling him you guys said that about him, by the way. One fifty-five. One fifty-five for Ross Pearson. Lightning fast left hand on Ross Pearson, man. His left hook is lights out. Oh, fun, fun fight tomorrow night. Francisco Mazzaratua Trinaldo. Up next in the heavyweight division, Travis Hubba Brown fights Matt Mitrio. I have been looking forward to the return of Matt Mitrio for quite some time because you know he made a very costly mistake against Big Ben Rothwell back in June, went for the first takedown of his UFC career, gets caught, gets submitted, and that ate him up inside. Coming into this fight, the last fight of his current UFC contract, he has a lot to prove. It seems like every time he gets a big opportunity, he stumbles. This is another big opportunity for Meathead. Can he put it all together? That's what I want to know. There's no way he's over 265. No, so just is. announce it away. Let's go. 249. 249 for Matt Mitrio. Glad it was 249 and not 247. <laughs> His uh -oh. opponent, Travis Hoppa Brown. I believe wow. he found the right fit at Glendale Fight Club with head trainer Edmund Tarverdian. After what he calls a year of growth in 2015, he really wants to show off the education he said he's receiving in the gym. Travis and his team believes he cleaned up his striking and has really matured as an athlete. Brown said he's anxious to prove to the world he is the statement maker he believes himself to be. And I don't know if it came across via television, but a smattering of booze here for Travis Brown, which is a little bit surprising. And they continue. This is meathead country. Apparently so. 238. 238 for Hoppa. Of course, no secret that Travis Brown has had a tumultuous 2015, so obviously that could explain some of it, but... It's a big fight for both these guys to overcome these mental hurdles. Travis yeah. Brown, Matt 
that trio. A few words. Oh. Travis Brown didn't have anything to say. Oh, they love Eddie Alvarez here, of course. He is Philly's own, not that far from Boston. How about this little nugget, guys? Back in 2010, Eddie Alvarez won a fight in this very building. The main event defeated a veteran named Josh Neer. And so he's used to this building. He's used to fighting close to Philly. And in fact, he left Florida recently. Still very close with the Black Zillions. Henry Hooft is in his corner, but he's now training back home in Philly with the likes of Mark Henry former UFC fighter Frankie Perez and Frankie Edgar as well. They love him here. Listen to that chant. 155 and a half. 155 and a half for the Andrews. And Henry Hoof normally won't care. He doesn't train actively. He will corner any to the I'll tell you what, I don't know if we've seen eyes like that on Anthony Pettis in a long time. Not since the WC days. He said himself, I babied myself as a champion. I started planning out my years way ahead of time. Was going too easy. Now, the fire is lit underneath him. And this is as focused as we've seen Anthony Pettis in a long time. And that is dangerous for the lightweight division. 155 and a half. 155 and a half for Showtime. Also a little bit surprised of the booze here, right? I, mean, I am. Maybe it's because we're in Eddie Alvarez. He's coach, country. baby, yeah. But this is a fun atmosphere for this fight. Look at that stare down. I'm a Pennsylvania guy as well, and Eddie Alvarez had a legion of fans for a long time yeah. in Philadelphia. Congratulations on another successful title defense and there's a long line of challengers waiting for you. TJ Dillashaw versus Dominic Cruz is the most important fight in the history of the bantamweight division. It is the return of the former champion in Dominic Cruz, arguably the best bantamweight champion ever that never lost his title inside the octagon, but was forced to relinquish his title because of a series of catastrophic injuries. During that time, we have seen greatness emerge from TJ Dillashaw. His destruction of Hen and Burrell. The devastating beatdown of Hen and Burrell in the rematch. Dillashaw remains the champion outstanding. You're seeing an overwhelmingly confident TJ Dillashaw, a guy who's truly emerging as not just champion, but a real candidate for one of the best pound for pound fighters on the planet. He learned the style that he's won a championship with by watching me fight. With me going, let's face it, they needed to build anybody they could in that slot. The division's just been trying to strive and, and build with me gone. Now that I'm coming back, it can get back on its feet again. That's the truth. I've had everything I earned completely taken away from me. So I'm a hungry guy right now. I've been watching Dominic fight for a while. I've been picking him apart and seeing his mistakes for a long time. I don't know if he believes in what he's actually saying or if it's just all talk. I mean, the guy's the boringest fighter on history. He runs around and, and he can't do any damage. He never, never going for the finish. I'm there to win, and if that means picking you apart one tiny shot at a time, okay, let's so be it. And if that means punching your head through the fence, then outstanding. I'm not looking to, to point fight. I'm gonna prove that my footwork's there for a reason, not just to dance around and look flashy. I'm doing it to knock you out. The resume speaks for itself. And the guys that he's beaten, I don't know where they're at right now. I know where the guys I've fought are at. The top five of every division, 125 and 135. He needs to fight me to have somebody on his resume. And he'll have a loss because of it. You know, he's going to try to run around. I'm going to wear him out. I'm going to make him tired. And I'm going to finish him. Man, I'm ready to shut this guy's mouth. You know, I've got all kinds of stats I prepared to read right now, but honestly, folks, if there's something I can tell you about this man in my years of sitting up here with him, his singular focus, his will, his determination, his ability to make every single fight cataclysmic and feeling like he has to prove to the world that he is the best drives him more than any fighter I've ever been around. Back. One 
135. 135 for the Dominator. If there's a fighter who can overcome this amount of adversity, hey, one fight the last four years, it's him, Dominic Cruz. UFC Bantamweight Champion of the World, DJ Gillishaw. And guys, to echo my previous point, just the fact that Dominic is here, I mean, you, you gotta be happy for the guy that he made it to this point. But there he is, the UFC Bantamweight Champion, TJ Dillashaw. I have felt for a long time that you can't be the undisputed champion until you beat Dominic Cruz. He gets that opportunity finally tomorrow night. In my opinion, it's the best fight that the UFC could put on in 2016. Right there. 100% takedown defense rate. Has the highest significant strike average per round in the division's history as well. 135! Can't wait for this stare down right here. Of course, no love lost between these two. Dominic Cruz has been getting the better of TJ, the verbal exchanges. But in just a matter of moments, the time for talking will almost soon be over. Here we go. The talking continues. I love it. Dom wants to be in his head. Part of his game is to frustrate him. Oh, oh, chase him. They can try and find him. For the belt. First visit with Dominic Cruz. Dom, it's been a very heated back and forth between you and TJ, so I will ask you simply, what is going to happen tomorrow night? We're going out there to fight. I just want to say to everybody, thank you so much for the support, following me through. Austin, thank you for being awesome. I just want to say thanks for being here through the battle I'm calling life right now. Here's another test. I'm going to win it. Dominic Cruz, ladies and gentlemen. Here's a champion, TJ Dillashaw. TJ, you have said that the game has passed Dominic by. You are now the prototype at 135, and you expect to prove it, don't you? Oh, absolutely, man. I'm going to have a smile on my face and have a good time and uh, look for that knockout again. Going to be a great show. Oh, I'm pumped, man. I'm so pumped. TJ Dillashaw, our main event, live and free on FS1. All right, that makes Thank it official. Everybody. It has been two years since Dominic Cruz was stripped of his title due to injury, so how will the Dominator go about reclaiming the UFC belt we discuss when we return?